Welcome to the Hidden Factor in Relationship Disharmony. I'm Marnia Robinson. I'm the author of a book called Cupid's Poisoned Arrow, From Habit to Harmony in Sexual Relationships. I was in four weddings, as a bride or a bridesmaid. All of us were children of parents who stayed married until death parted them. Yet all of our marriages ended in divorce, and three of us have remarried. I wanted to know what was at the bottom of this phenomenon. Exactly why were unions becoming so fragile? Intimate relationships are potentially an enormous source of well-being and even healing. Close, trusted companionship can reduce stress, make wounds heal faster, and even help AIDS patients live longer. Unfortunately, biology has programmed us so that, on average, our romances tend to deteriorate over time, and sometimes very rapidly. In fact, those couples who are natural swans are so rare that researchers refer to them as outliers, or exceptions to the rule. So what is the rule? Studies reveal that after a brief honeymoon period, mates typically find each other more irritating as a marriage continues for as long as it lasts. Mysteriously, this phenomenon doesn't affect relationships with relatives, pets, or friends. What is different about romantic relationships? Now, tension in intimate relationships can obviously come from many factors, such as money management differences, childhood trauma, or personal eccentricities. But there is also a hidden biological factor that magnifies them all. It shows up as an uneasy, often subconscious, feeling of irritation, which makes any other challenges more difficult to resolve. And wild as it may seem, this factor could just be the common denominator in behaviors that seem quite unrelated, such as bickering, insensitivity, oversensitivity, infidelity, and sexless marriages. It turns out that this factor has been present in our genetic programming for many millions of years. It's just becoming more obvious now for reasons I'll mention later. The fact is we have two conflicting biological programs at work in our love lives. I think of one of them as our mating program and the other as our bonding program. Let's look at the mating program first. We are mammals, and the typical mammalian mating program looks a lot like this. Start by pursuing a mate or seducing a mate with tremendous drive. Mate furiously. In fact, in some species, vigorous mating helps prepare the female for pregnancy. Then, after repeated copulations, when sexual desire is exhausted, move on to a novel partner. It's worth noting that mammals have no clear idea why they move on when they do. This subconscious program simply makes the former mate look like boiled cabbage, and an unfamiliar potential mate often look like a box of delicious chocolate truffles, at least for a while. Pair bonding is unique to a mere handful of mammals, including humans. We pair bonders evolved to get a buzz not just from sex, but also from romantic companionship. Why do some mammals pair bond? Because their infants survive better with two caregivers. We need our parents to fall in love, at least for long enough for them both to fall in love with us. If we do what we've always done, we'll get what we've always gotten. We're wired that way. Yet we can learn to steer for the results we want, whatever those may be if we think of our mating and bonding programs as two separate pedals that drive our intimate relationships. I think of the mating program, the urge to exhaust ourselves sexually as thoroughly as possible, as the habituation pedal, because it so often causes partners to get fed up with or habituate to each other. The bonding program, on the other hand, is the harmony pedal, because it genuinely makes togetherness more appealing and deeply satisfying. Although bonding originated as a mechanism for bonding infant mammals to their caregivers, we're encoded 
to find these behaviors, such as skin-to-skin -skin contact, exchanging smiles, and generous touch, pleasurable at any age. This is why we can use them strategically to strengthen our enthusiasm for lasting intimacy indefinitely, if that's a goal. We can also use Caretza to transform intercourse itself into a soothing, non-goal-oriented bonding behavior for use when procreation is not desired. I'd like to add that obviously humanity's subconscious mating agenda is not a new challenge, but there are two developments that make it more urgent than ever to cultivate authentic harmony between couples. Our culture has changed. We have more freedom and more sexual stimulation. Until recently, across much of the globe, church and state kept a reign on sexual expression. Marriages were often arranged. Divorce was impossible and then heavily censored. Birth control was unavailable or prohibited. And adultery or sex before marriage were strictly punished. All these features of life ensured that any emotional separation between partners was partly masked by the fact that they had to continue to live together and raise their inevitable children. These circumstances also meant that there was just plain less fooling around after the honeymoon period, in most couples' lives at least. That left relationships often uncomfortably stagnant, but less volatile. Today's social and civil sanctions, in the West at least, can no longer hold mates in artificial bondage. Now that's fine, and some of us see it as a good thing. But it means that our underlying mammalian mating program is ripping couples and families apart with increasing efficiency. As we no longer live in tribes based on mutual support, this outcome is agonizing for all concerned. With each new generation, there are fewer and fewer couples who escape the misery of habituation. There's another very potent but unacknowledged factor also at work today. We are guinea pigs in a massive international experiment. Today's overtly sexual media routinely evoke supernormal, that is above normal, sexual stimulation in our brains. And I'm not just talking about porn, but our ads, our clothing, our mainstream magazines, our TV shows. We don't think about it because it's so widespread. But an internet user, for example, can see more extreme erotica in an afternoon than his ancestors would have seen in a lifetime. And our brains may just not be equipped to handle this overload. There is a way to make love so that you get the benefits of union without tripping the habituation switch. And some of them are noted on this slide. The Gnostic Christians stumbled upon something they called the Sacrament of the Bridal Chamber, which seems to be based on these principles. The courtly love tradition a thousand years later in the south of France. The Chinese Taoists in China for thousands of years have known it. Now the version of what I call bonding-based sex that I find the most accessible simply because the texts about it are more modern, is called Caretza. My girlfriend and I have been trying non-orgasmic sex with screw-ups for maybe four months now. We are both in our mid-twenties and have been together for about six months. We started our relationship really slowly. We would hold eye contact for hours, literally, and gently touch and stroke one another on the arms or the belly or we would touch our feet together under the table if other people were around. Things progressed and we started to kiss and there was more stroking and touching while lying down in bed. Every afternoon we would rush off after work to be together for a few hours. I didn't realize it then, but we were pretty much doing some of the exchanges. Now, as an aside, the exchanges are a series of 21 playful affectionate activities for couples who want a structured way to transition toward Caretza and they are in the back of the book, Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. Long story short, we've had some wonderful experiences, and I've gotten better at making love this way as I've been developing some guidelines. I'm now finding it easier to say no thanks to my animal thoughts, even when I have a naked and horny female provoking me. Here are the rules I have for myself. I know how obvious some of these appear, but it's so easy for the animal brain to kick in 
and for the rational mind to lazily accept what the animal one is doing.